Welcome to New Market Arms. I'm Chip McWilliams, and this is the inaugural episode of a new channel dedicated to antique military firearms and military history. Over the years, people have often asked me about the name New Market Arms and its significance. So this first episode will explain how that came to be. The short answer is New Market Arms is named after the Civil War Battle of New Market, Virginia, that occurred on May 15, 1864. New Market, Virginia is located in the Shenandoah Valley, and in the spring of 1864, General Ulysses S. Grant implemented a strategic plan to defeat the Confederacy in the East. As he continued to hammer Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in the eastern part of the state, Grant ordered Union Major General Franz Siegel and his new Department of West Virginia to attack Confederate forces in the Shenandoah Valley to both destroy the agricultural capacity of the valley and to threaten General Lee's flank to the west. Siegel, who was a political general, would fail at Newmarket due in large part to the cadets of the Virginia Military Institute. I graduated from the Virginia Military Institute, also known as VMI, in 1990, and thus the name Newmarket Arm. VMI was founded on November 11, 1839, as a military school. Prior to that, the location served as a state armory. Upon its founding in 1839, the cadets could not only learn to become future leaders of the state, both military and civilian, but the cadets could also guard the armory, a mission and a duty they continue to this day. With the approach of war in 1859, VMI was both strategically and geographically placed in a location that saw it serve in several different capacities. The first notable of these involved abolitionist John Brown. Brown, who led his attack on the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, then part of Virginia, was captured by Colonel Robert E. Lee of the U.S. Army, along with a detachment of United States Marines. Brown was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for treason against the Commonwealth of Virginia on November 2, 1859. John Brown's execution for hanging was set for December 2, 1859, and the governor of Virginia was concerned that other abolitionists in the United States may try and free him from jail before he could be hanged. To prevent this, the governor increased security in and around Charlestown, Virginia. As part of this security effort, the governor ordered VMI to provide a security detail for the hanging. VMI Superintendent Francis H. Smith and a young Major Thomas J. Jackson, later known as Stonewall, led the VMI cadets from Lexington to Charlestown. The cadets formed a cordon around the gibbet and Brown was hanged at 11.15 a.m. on December 2nd. The VMI Corps of Cadets went back to barracks in Lexington and continued their studies, all the while with an eye on the coming war and wondering what role they would play. As can be seen from these photos, the cadets at that time really were boys in many respects. Back then, cadets could enter VMI as young as 15, and the same was true at the U.S. Military Academy and other military schools in the U.S. Because of this, the Ordnance Department developed what were known as cadet muskets, which were slightly smaller and lighter than regular arms. The first true cadet musket issued to VMI was the Springfield Model 1851 Cadet Musket, which is what you see here. VMI Museum Director Colonel Keith Gibson, who has a wealth of information about everything having to do with VMI and its history, wrote an article in 1995 about the Model 1851 muskets, which is where a lot of this information I'm about to give you comes from. On February 20th, 1850, President Zachary Taylor presided over the placement of the cornerstone to the George Washington Monument in Richmond, Virginia. The VMI Corps cadets were tasked that day to be the president's honor guard. Carrying their antiquated and oversized flintlock muskets, the VMI cadets favorably impressed President Taylor and the president then ordered that the VMI Corps cadets be issued with the new cadet musket then being developed by Springfield Armory. The Model 1851 cadet was a scaled-down version of the Springfield Model 1842 musket. It had a smaller smoothbore muzzle measuring 57 caliber compared to the Model 1842 69 caliber. It was slightly shorter and slightly lighter, and it even had a scaled-down bayonet that was issued with it. VMI received 200 Model 1851 cadet muskets comprising Springfield's entire 1851 production run, and all of these were marked 1851 on both the lock plate and the barrel, and these 200 muskets were received by VMI on September 16, 1852. The cadets would drill with these weapons, which they carried with them to John's, John Brown's hanging in 1859, up through the beginning of the Civil War. Now, it's difficult to talk about VMI during the Civil War, and even to talk about the Springfield Model 1851 Cadet Musket without mentioning Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson. 
who was then an instructor at VMI in natural philosophy, what we would today call physics, and artillery tactics. Shortly after Virginia seceded from the Union, Major Jackson left VMI and in Lexington, Virginia, helped form what would become known as the Stonewall Brigade. One of those units formed in Lexington was known as the Rock Bridge Grays. This unit would become Company H of the 4th Virginia Infantry. The Rock Bridge Grays were actually formed at VMI and were initially quartered in the VMI barracks. They were also issued with the Cadets Springfield Model 1851 Cadet Muskets. Jackson led the brigade and the Rock Bridge Grays along with all of the Cadets Model 1851 Cadet Muskets on May 3, 1861 en route to Harper's Ferry. Two months later, and still armed with the VMI Model 1851 Muskets, the Rockbridge Grays fought at the First Battle of Manassas, which is also known as First Bull Run, where Jackson earned the name Stonewall. Now a Confederate Brigadier General, Stonewall Jackson wrote in late 1861 to the aide to the governor of Virginia, quote, I regret to say that Captain Updike's company, the Rockbridge Grays, has not turned in the cadet muskets, and I fear that I will be unable to forward them to the VMI and to their place can be supplied with other percussion muskets. I'm very desirous of having them return and have made every effort to effect that object, but in vain, end quote. The Rockbridge Grays did receive replacement arms and the cadets, Model 1851 muskets, were returned to VMI in late 1861. Armed again with their Model 1851 cadet muskets, the VMI Corps cadets continued their studies and military training and were called out for various contingency missions over the next two years. In the meantime, at the Battle of Chancellorsville, perhaps Stonewall Jackson's greatest battle, on the night of May 2, 1863, Jackson was returning to camp when he was accidentally shot by soldiers from the 18th North Carolina Infantry. In total, Jackson was shot three times, once in the right hand and twice in the left arm. This highly romanticized image from the time purports to show Jackson's wounding at Chancellorsville, but it's not accurate. It was actually raining, and it was in the middle of the night. As it was raining, Jackson was wearing his waterproof oilcloth jacket. Here you can see the jacket Stonewall Jackson was wearing that night when he was shot in 1863. This jacket is now on display at the VMI Museum. Because of, of the severity of the injuries to his left arm, it was amputated almost immediately. Stonewall Jackson then developed pneumonia and ultimately died as a result on May 10, 1863. His body was then moved by train to Richmond and on to Lexington, Virginia. Stonewall Jackson's body was then placed in his old classroom in the VMI barracks on May 14, 1863, and the Corps of Cadets escorted his body the next day for burial at the Lexington Cemetery. Exactly one year after Stonewall Jackson's burial, the VMI Corps of Cadets would face their own trial by fire. Briefly back to VMI Springfield Model 1851 Cadet Muskets for a moment. Realizing that the Corps of Cadets could be called into active service at any time, and realizing that the Springfield Model 1851 Cadet Muskets were insufficient as a smoothbore weapon, VMI Superintendent General Smith requested a suitable replacement from the Adjutant General of Virginia. Ultimately, VMI was provided with 200 Austrian Model 1854 Lorenz rifles in early 1864. Having been called out several times since the war began, but never committed to actual combat, the call finally came for VMI in May 1864. With General Siegel marching up the Shenandoah Valley from Winchester, there were only about 1,500 Confederate troops under General J.D. Embedden in Siegel's way. General Embedden notified General Smith at VMI to have the Corps of Cadets held in readiness to reinforce this small force. In overall command of Confederate forces in the Shenandoah Valley, General John C. Breckinridge moved north and ordered the Corps of Cadets to meet his troops at Stanton, Virginia on May 12th. The cadets were woken by a long roll of the drums on the night of May 10th and ordered to march the next morning. The cadets began their march north from their barracks on Wednesday, May 11th in the rain along the old Stanton Road and camped about 18 miles north of VMI. On May 12th, the Corps marched another 18 miles to Stanton and linked up with General Breckinridge's forces. The next day, May 13th, the Corps marched about 20 miles down the Valley Pike to just south of Harrisonburg. On May 14th, the Corps of Cadets continued their march for another 15 miles and went into camp about seven miles south of Newmarket. 
The cadets were quietly aroused around 1 a.m. on Sunday, May 15th, which was a dark and rainy night. After a prayer by Captain Frank Preston of B Company, the Corps cadets started to march towards the battlefield at Newmarket, arriving in the vicinity shortly after sunrise of the 15th. Just as the Corps, now in line of battle, crested Shirley's Hill, they received their first casualties from Union artillery fire. It must have been a foreboding experience with artillery fire around them and a thunderstorm simultaneously breaking right over their heads. The Corps cadets were still in reserve and not yet committed to the fight, however. They moved behind the advancing Confederate forces north-northwest past the town of Newmarket on their right. As the VMI Corps of Cadets continued to advance behind the main Confederate line, they approached the Bushong Farm. The Corps' four companies split off, with two companies passing on the east side and two companies on the west. The Bushongs had an orchard on the north side of the house, and it was here that a gap in the Confederate line developed. The only reserves available to General Breckenridge were the VMI Corps of Cadets and the 26th Virginia Battalion. The worrying gap in the Confederate line caused Breckenridge's aide, Major Charles Semple, to suggest putting the Corps of Cadets into the line. Breckenridge hesitated at first, but then decided there was no choice left if he was to win the battle. General Breckenridge then gave the famous order to Major Semple, put the boys in, and may God forgive me for the order. Directly facing the cadets were the 34th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment and a battery from the 30th New York Artillery. Upon receiving the order, the cadets filled in the gap and began to move forward and quickly began to charge up the slope towards the 30th New York. The ground was a morass after days of rain coupled with the movement of troops and horses over the ground. This became the field of lost shoes as the mud sucked the shoes right off the feet of many of the cadets. The cadets continued their attack, closing their ranks as artillery and musket fire thinned the ranks. Ultimately, they drove the 30th New York artillery from the field and captured one cannon. The Corps would continue northwards as the Union Army retreated until being stopped by General Breckinridge, who placed the Corps of Cadets back in reserve. The toll on the Corps of Cadets was heavy. The cadets entered the battle that day organized as a battalion of infantry with four companies, A through D, and a section of artillery. 257 cadets started that morning of May 15, 1864, but when it was over, Ten cadets would either be killed in action or would shortly afterwards succumb to their wounds, and another 45 cadets would be wounded in action, a casualty rate of 18%. The dead were initially buried near Newmarket, and the cadets who died of wounds were buried elsewhere. Eventually, six of the cadets killed at the Battle of Newmarket would be reinterred at VMI. One of the cadets who fought that day and was wounded in the battle was Moses Ezekiel. Ezekiel would eventually go on to become one of the most famous sculptors of the late 19th century. In memory of his fellow cadets who fell that day at Newmarket, later becoming Sir Moses Ezekiel, he created a statue called Virginia Mourning Her Dead, and that statue stands vigil over the cadets' graves at VMI. The graves look different now than when I was at VMI, and they have stones representing all 10 cadets killed at the battle. After the battle, the Corps cadets went to Richmond to train new Confederate soldiers, and VMI was left vacant. In reprisal for the cadets fighting at Newmarket, the barracks were shelled and burned less than a month later on June 12, 1864, in what became known as Hunter's Raid. For its role in the battle, VMI was awarded a battle streamer for the Battle of Newmarket. This streamer is affixed to the VMI flag that is carried in parades by the Corps of Cadets. Also in memory of their charge, the Corps of Cadets frequently conduct parades with fixed bayonets. The legacy of the Battle of Newmarket is very strong at VMI and in many ways is the defining moment in the school's history when young boys were thrust into battle for a lost cause. So that is why I call it Newmarket Arms. 
Thank you for joining me for this inaugural video, and please come back for more content on history and historical military firearms.